We are live. So welcome everybody um, to this evening's latest episode of Duo Talk with myself and Matthew Cochran. And today we are joined by a legend of the classical guitar. We are so privileged to have the wonderful Goran Solskjaer with us for the next hour to just talk about his career in music and his life in music. And Goran, I think you've made Matthew and I very happy um, because you're a bit of a hero to both of us. Thanks a lot. I'm happy to be here. It's, a, it's oh. an honor. It's really our honour. Um, it, it's it's absolutely wonderful. And to the community out there um, listening and watching, wherever you are, if it's on Twitter or if it's on Facebook or YouTube, um, if you want to join in the chat tonight, you can. You can leave a comment and um, we will try and answer it as best as we can as we go through the evening. Um, and we will be sharing some clips of Goran playing some beautiful music in different concert halls around the world and talking about many of the great recordings he made. So um, that might provoke you to have some thoughts about maybe the questions you'd like to ask. But for now, I'd uh, love to hand over to other Matthew, Matthew Cochran, and he's going to tell us a little bit about the man behind that amazing guitar. Well, Goran, thank you uh, so much uh, for, for joining us. And, and Matthew's right. We are both uh, enormous fans and we're very honored that you've uh, joined us for the live stream. So I'd like to uh, start talking about your recording career. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite a substantial one. You've made 19 records uh, for Deutsche Grammophon beginning in the late 1970s and continuing through uh, the early 2000s. Um, now, in that time, the record industry experienced profound changes. Um, and so my first question is, how did the methods of recording the guitar change throughout your career? Well, I mean, the first recording we, we made on, on a tape recorder and we actually cut with scissors in the tape. <laughs> and sometimes you, you, you end up losing the only take with, which was decent and had to look for it in the garbage. And, and I mean, it, it, it was kind of special. And um, I mean, in, in the end, you would do any, everything in the computer and and um, i mean it, it it got actually i have to say it got much much easier and much more calm for for each year so so that, that was nice were you involved in the uh in the editing the actual physical editing with magnetic tape in, yeah in the beginning because uh, wow. the guy who made my recordings he, he was more kind of a pop uh, producer and uh, but he had fantastic ears and mm. uh, so he could make a beautiful sound but uh, when it came to editing uh, I, I had to had to be there and I really wanted to be there of course uh, hey. in the in the end uh, the last 10 years I, I I really trusted my producer in Hamburg uh, that the, he would do a good job which he, I mean he, he, he made it much better than I would have done so, so that that was no problem. Wow, wow, did, Goran, did it? Did it? Um, did Did you feel a, per, a a definite change between like how you would have played when you knew it was tape, and then after the the digital came around, did it make you play differently in sessions? Did it make you think about mm -hmm. about how you were going to do take after take, or I don't know how exactly you, you obviously did the recordings for for Deutsche Grammophon, but I know myself when you record, like you know. It's so different to playing live. I wonder if the the difference had an effect on how you thought about it. Well, no, I, I think I always did it uh, more or less the same way. Uh, well, first I would practice maybe a year before the recording because I I I think I, I built my career, career or what you whatever you, you would, would call it uh, very much around my recordings because I'm. I'm not the kind of person who wants to travel around uh, all, all the time living in hotel rooms. I prefer to stay home and hopefully I've managed to have the same wife all the time. And I mean, so, so it, it's better to, to focus on, on the recordings and to, for each recording, I, I did the same. I, I normally did three takes of, uh, of one piece. The first take is normally uh, too careful, too much careful. 
The second one is normally is the best one, and the third one I'm getting a little bit uh, uh, not so concentrated. Uh, then, uh, yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. it's nearly always the second take that we. I mean, in very rare cases, you don't need. To, we didn't need to do anything. Just uh, go to next piece, or if there was a mistake or so, we we could probably find a better take and just usually from take three and then just just cut it in. So so wow. it's not that complicated and. Uh, this method it hasn't changed over the years it was just the same wow so three three takes that seems yeah normally yeah that that seems like not very much to me <laughs> well i mean it's uh, i think after three takes i'm exhausted actually mm -hmm. so, yeah. so because uh, as you know we we have to focus so intensely uh, while recording so so i mean it's better to really focus for for 10 minutes and mm -hmm. try to do something nice and then, then to go on for hours and try to maybe i can do this a little bit little bit better i mean yeah you I find that you're very, sorry my do, do you find that your uh, that, that your focus or your ability to focus has changed in this you know span of time since you started recording until now no, I don't. I, I, it, it has. I, I, I see it a little bit uh, the same way as, as I, I played a lot of golf tournaments when I was younger, and I think the, the concentration is exactly the same. Ah. Mm. Uh, really, to, to be able to, to focus 100% in a certain moment uh, and uh, really to do your best in the, these 10 minutes or whatever it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's so different to the world now, um, you know, of recording, I think, where, you know, sometimes, and I think, you know, negatively, unfortunately, recordings are composites, they're, they're you know, they're pieced together from thousands and thousands of yeah. edits, you know, um, it, it's, it, that's wonderful, keeping that sense of the musical line, and the direction that you, you all, it's the, it's a thing that just, I mean, we're talking about recordings, and I've just got, I've got all your recordings here. Like, they're all here. Yeah. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> I know, I know. Like, this is where oh, you get... Another one. <laughs> this is where you get a restraining order now, Goran. <laughs> um, like, oh. even, oh, even your own vinyl is, is, Isn't that uh, Barueco? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. But, you know, you listen to these recordings, and I remember, like... Um, Kind of wearing these recordings out almost um, when I was a student by just listening to them over and over again, and it was it was for it was for your musicianship. It was the the long lyrical lines that you would play with, and I, and that probably comes back to that you know the three takes and taking the best take, and having you know not this micro edited um, composite recording, which is unfortunately all the rage at the moment. Yeah, well. Well, I'm 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 flattered and and re really happy. I mean, it's uh, thank you so much. But I, I mean, my idea wa was uh, really that I should be able to play the piece uh, without mistakes before going into the studio. Yeah. Even if that, as I managed man mentioned it, I would prepare maybe a year or so each recording. But uh, but th these day these two days or, or what we would spend for for a record, I mean I, I should really be able to to play well, to 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 make a, a nice uh, musical result. That that was my idea. And also I mean recording for Deutsche Grammophon, I mean they they don't pay you uh, to to stay there two weeks recording. Yeah. I mean you you, you I mean you would get. I mean, it costs a lot of money to rent a studio or church or whatever. And uh, I mean, we would usually go there one evening and get a good sound. And then we would record two days. And then we go to the golf course because my, my producer, he, he play, also plays golf. <laughs> so we went there to celebrate the next day. And I mean, so yeah. these, these two days really have to work. Yeah, I, I think really. it's a good good thing to have that. 
I wouldn't call it pressure, but but uh, but uh, say na name it challenge instead. Yeah, there's like <laughs> a, a beginning and an end. Yes. To the to the session, and that 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 puts I think a a, a, a lot of that requires you to focus. Now, did you uh, did you always record in the same uh, venue, or were they no. different venues? Yes, many different. I mean. Uh, we started here in Sweden. The first three records we did for Swedish Deutsche Grammophon. Ah. But uh, since they sold a lot of copies, uh, after a while uh, they called from a Hamburg office and, and wanted to take over. Mm. So it, it, it was uh, basically different all the time. One, wow. the, 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 the record, uh, the Cavatina record, we recorded it that in in a pop studio, really, which was completely dry, uh, and uh, so that was quite fun actually, to, because uh, my producer created the sound afterwards, and I think he got this. Uh, oh. They call it the lexicon echo. Oh yeah, sure, of course. Yeah, I I, th I think he got the first uh, machine uh, that came to Europe, and he got it like two days before the recording. Wow. So, so it was really fun to to so he played with i recorded during day uh, time and he played with the machine in the night uh, to to find a nice sound and so that that was great you were uh, the guinea pig <laughs> yeah that's really amazing because you know first of all i find the sound of your recordings to be incredibly consistent from your okay. very earliest recordings until your very latest recording. So I think that has a lot to do, well, I'd love for you to tell us, but I'm assuming it has a lot to do with your fingers and your well, instruments, that kind of thing. Yeah, well, it, it could be that, I mean, uh, I, I have used the same guitar uh, all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, for, for, for almost all recordings, uh, six string, I, I used my Ramirez guitar, which I bought when I was 14 years old and uh, and then I've used uh, these eleven-string guitars. They, I, I got four four of them, and uh, they sound really very much the same. It's the mm -hmm. same maker, so so it it could be uh, that even if I change the room, it it, it sounds. Uh, but, but but I must say I I have some recordings where where I really think the sound quality is better than than uh, some of the others. <laughs> is there one that's a favorite for you or a couple that yeah, are favorites I think, for you? Yeah, I think this, uh, this, uh, there is one 11 string Baroque where I, I really love the sound quality. Yes. This one. I mean, yeah. this is, this, I'm sorry to just go on about this, but this literally is my favorite guitar record. Oh, I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> you win, Gordon. You've won. <laughs> <laughs> this is the number one. Oh, <laughs> the thanks. greatest of all time. Um, but it's the sound. The sound of it was the thing. As soon as I heard it, the first time I heard it, I was just um, sort of transfixed by the sound. You know, yeah. and, it's, it's uh, really good sound quality. And who who is the luthier of your of your guitars? You say it's the same maker that's made these these guitars over the years. What's the name? Yeah, um, the eleven string guitar was made by. Uh, person in Swedish, he, his name would be Georg Bolin. So it's uh, uh, like uh, George. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he, uh, I mean, my teacher, uh, Per Olof Jonsson, um, yeah. he studied at the Schola Cantorum Basiliensis in Basel in Switzerland in the early 60s and uh, tried to play the lute, but he was never happy with his, the, the sound from his nails and the lute. So when he came back to Sweden, he contacted his guitar maker, which was Mr. Bolin, and asked him uh, if they could do something. So mm. in the late 60s, they, uh, I think this model, or around 1970, uh, this 11-string guitar w was born, so to say. Mm. Well, this would be a perfect moment to actually hear you play something. So um, as always on these episodes, I have a few clips of whatever topic we're discussing and we've got some beautiful clips of you playing um and you're gonna after after we hear this you know a minute or so of you playing it would be great to hear um about you know 
your concert tours, and also where this is that you're actually playing, because it's a stunning hall. So um, we'll, we'll ha have a little listen to you now playing the um, the Bach Saramand um, from the from the C minor suite. Okay. Beautiful. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a good composer. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's a composer that's meant a lot to you over the years, for certain. Yeah, he had, he had some talent. I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, for sure. So where, where was that concert? This one uh, was from in Tokyo, in a, a hall named uh, Tokyo Bunka Kaikan Hall which is uh, actually very ne near the zoo <laughs> in, in Tokyo hmm. <laughs> and near ne and near the biggest uh, subway station named uh, Ueno, Ueno station oh. where they have like five million, million people passing every day. Wow. Yeah. So we took a taxi instead. <laughs> <to do. laughs> so you made it on time. Good. Yeah, I did. Yeah. It, it's one of my favorite uh, halls. I mean, the, the concert, concert halls in Japan are just so fantastic the acoustic it's incredible beautiful and and you know matthew was mentioning there that you know um obviously you know you said Bach's a great composer he is you know decent he's caught on after all these years you know but what what made um what drew you to that repertoire when you were when you were starting out when you were thinking about what pieces you would play and how you would make your mark because obviously Bach is something that it's a huge part of your career and a huge part of your music making. Yeah. Well, basically, I, I love his music so much. And uh, I, I always come back to his music and uh, it means so, so much to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it might sound stupid, but uh, I very often start the day by playing a Saraban by Bach. Yeah just to get in, in a good mood and uh, be happy. And then, I mean, it, it's a beautiful day to, to way to start the day, I think. Wow. And, yes. uh, I mean, I mean, and I, many, many musicians. Uh, I know Pablo Casals, mm -hmm. he did that. On piano, mm -hmm. as I understand. Oh, really? Yeah, that's that's well, that's the story I heard. I don't oh. know if that's true, but I yeah, I, that's that, yeah. That would be, that would be terrible if I would uh, do it on the piano. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't. That, the the <laughs> thought of doing that is is yeah, is pretty yeah. disturbing. Oh. Yeah. To me, well, you know, actually, the the <clears throat> one of the things that Matthew and I have have spoken about on a, on a number of occasions is that as the recording industry has moved forward you know sometimes uh you know if you're listening to let's say 
seven different interpretations of a loot suite. I would say six of them I may not be able to identify. Really? But if one of them is yours, yeah, we can definitely, I, I think we both have, have said on a number of occasions that we can identify that recording as yours and uh, it feels unique and it feels very personal. Um, yeah. And uh, so that's, I think that your approach to Bach, um, well, uh, it has, has certainly inspired both of us and I think many, many other people. Well, th well, thank you. I, I, I mean, all I, all I, can, I, I can just say I, I love this music from, from mm. the bottom of my heart. And uh, mm. maybe I'm, I'm that kind of person that I, I like when, when it's uh, kind of calm and order and balance <laughs> in mm -hmm. life. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm always looking for balance in the music, and uh, I mean Bach was a master uh, in this aspect, uh, of course. And, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's 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 fascinating. I mean, it, it, I even think of this the comment that Matthew just made about it having a distinctive sound that immediately I know it's you playing, and and I think there are other players like that as well. Like I always feel that about David Russell's playing. I always feel like that about. Um, obviously, Julian Bream's playing. You can't yeah. kind of, you know, mistake that. Um, but it, that carries through not just to your 11-string playing, your multi-string guitar playing. I feel like that when we hear you playing six strings, because you've obviously got a six-string guitar behind you, you know. Um, yeah. To, you know, um, and is that is that the guitar you go to all the time, or do you, you know, when no. you were pick up the, the Bach in the morning just to set the mood, it's kind of a meditation. Would it be on the six string or would it be on the eleven? It doesn't matter. It's it's okay. the it's uh, it's the music. Uh, uh, I'm I'm looking for not 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 so much the the type of guitar or the instrument yeah. or, mm. or anything. I mean, I I love listening to to Bach on the piano, harpsichord, violin, whatever. It, it doesn't matter if it if it's a good musician. Uh, uh, that that's fine. Yeah. Really. Yeah. I, I came across some years ago a beautiful recording with a pianist named uh, uh, Leon Fleischer. Oh yes, and, yeah. and you know he, he, when when he was young he he was a real master, and then he got kind of got some problems with his right hand. He yeah. was paralyzed for years and years and years, and by the end of his life they tried to. Uh, to, to put uh, inject uh, Botox in his hand, and suddenly he could play again. <laughs> and he made this CD called Two Hands. Mm. And uh, it's it's so, so amazing because I, I was looking for uh, this uh, Bach piece, piece, The Sheep May Safely Graze, mm. is the title. And uh, it's, I think it's a cantata or something. Uh, and. Uh, I was looking at Spotify for, for different recordings because I love the piece and I couldn't find any good. But suddenly mm. I came across his recording and I, I didn't know anything about him, but I could feel that here is a person who is grateful for something <laughs> that was so obvious. And wow. then I checked him out on the internet and I read the story of his life. That suddenly, after 30, 40 years, he was able to play again. And he made this recording and he played this piece. And through internet, computer, or whatever, uh, it went so directly into my heart. And I mean, that, I mean, that kind of music is, is that, that's, that's what I think we are all looking for. And that kind of performance. And I mean, it doesn't matter to me if, if it's a guitar or a piano or whatever. I mean, music is so much bigger than that. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Absolutely. It's, long, it's a long story, sorry, but, but I, I'm, I, I, I'm still so confused over, 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 the, over the fact that, <laughs> that it's possible to, to hear <laughs> that someone is grateful in a recording. I think it's beautiful. I mean, I that, that, that that's the meaning, meaning of music really to express saw, feelings that way i mean it's it's a little bit different i think in the sense that um what i'm about to say i saw an interview recently with the, another piano player um keith jarrett 
yeah. who had re- who recently or fairly, I think a few years ago, had some strokes and he's lost the power of his left hand. So he's not playing with the left hand, but he's still playing with the right hand. And he's yeah. obviously playing incredibly with his right hand. It's it's not, it's, it, and, and thinking about music and listen to, listening to him talk and listening to the way he was thinking about the music, I think it's the gratefulness that you're talking about. I, I hadn't thought about it as gratefulness, but I thought about it like it really mattered. It really counted what he was what he was doing and what he was thinking about the music. So, I think you can hear it. I think you're right. You know. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. Uh, Keith Jarrett. I mean, when he's playing, I mean, he, he's for me one of my really heroes. Yeah, yeah. It's it's so clean and it's so still so powerful. Yeah, that that's really amazing. Yeah. Well, it's it's funny that there's a bit of a thread here because we're talking about um, musicians who have experienced some form of limitation, mm-hmm. yeah. um, which is you know very much the what you put on yourself. You put the limitation of time yeah. uh, uh, on yourself uh, uh, when you record, and there 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 might be some there might be some magic to that. What I'm interested in is is how has your approach to box music changed? Uh, over the years, yeah, see, it, it, yeah, absolutely. It, it follow. It uh, actually goes hand in hand with my life. How so? Yeah, how so? <laughs> what, <laughs> what shall I say? I mean, well, I mean, a young person. Uh, at least, if I speak for myself, I, I was kind of not it was not so complicated. I was more very direct, straightforward, uh, looking for uh, clarity. Uh, try to make everything sound very easy and uh, now we're getting a, a little bit older uh, of course with with the experience of, of a life uh, I, I'm looking for also for other things um, which is well it's difficult to, to say in words really but uh, may, maybe if it was more black and white when I was young it's more full of colors now I I, I, I think Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, I, I, I'm. I, it still change all the time. I'm. I'm still. Uh, thanks God, I'm. I'm still looking every day for for how to how to play in a different way and, and how to mm-hmm. make things better and so. Wow. Well, we have um, some questions coming in from the wider guitar community, and there's one which is really fascinating, and it's it's taking you away from the. The almost philosophical there, um, Goran, which was so beautiful, to something a bit more, a bit more practical, a bit more pragmatic. But there's a question from Peter, and he posted it on Facebook. That's where he's watching. Hi, Goran and Matthews. Um, question for Goran: With many stringed guitars, eleven strings, for example, how difficult is it to cope with the problem of open strings ringing on after you don't want them to? Um, and what techniques did you use, or do you use, to silence them? Well, I think uh, the guitar maker, uh, Bolin, he helps me a little bit because his guitars uh, don't have a lot of, do you say overtones? In, yeah. In, in English, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, it's, it, they have a very clean sound. So if I take off the five extra strings on my 11 string guitar and use on, play only on six strings, it's really uh, very, how shall I say, extremely clean the sound because if i mean if you have a normal guitar with a full sound and you add five strings to that it, it it's it's a hell i mean it's it's it, you will get so much noise uh, and you know don't need it uh, obviously i mean yeah so, so that helps a little bit but uh, okay but let's say that it, it takes five years to find the, the extra bass strings and it takes 10 years to stop them ringing, uh, to learn that again. <laughs> so, so, I mean, it's really important. I mean, it's like the pedal on a, on a piano. You have to find a technique where you very quickly can stop uh, yeah. the, these strings from, from ringing and just using them uh, when you need it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, if you change from C major to G major already, you have to to take up the pedal in between. Yeah. Otherwise, it's ridiculous. It sounds terrible. 
Yeah, yeah. And and so how are some ways that you do that? Is it all with your thumb and muting, or yeah. is it left hand too? Yeah, if if I bend the thumb a little bit like that, I can I can put it put it very quickly on on this on the bass strings. Okay. And uh, without changing the hand position very much. So you're muting multiple, multiple yeah. strings yeah. with your thumb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh -huh. It's too tricky to to start uh, muting one string here and one string there. It, that's oh. too, too. I mean, it's. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I mute it all. It's would you use Would you use the the front of the thumb, as well as the Would you use different parts of the thumb? I guess is my question. I think it's the side or side of the thumb. Yeah, yeah, okay. like a, like muting on a a bass guitar or a or a yeah, yeah. electric guitar or something like you yeah. rather than because sometimes obviously just on the six string we're just planting the thumb. Yeah, but I, I think, on I think we should use I, we should use this uh, more on the six string guitar also, but that, because yeah. I mean very often we have the fifth and sixth string open and and when when we change from. A major to D major, I mean, or whatever. I mean, we have a lot of overtones ringing that uh, disturbs yeah. the, the sound. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I, think, I think we should learn uh, learn to use and um, to use our ears really to yeah. check check what 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 comes out of of this box when we are playing <laughs> when we are plucking. <laughs> well, well, surely hearing yourself back you know i mean you yeah. you've you've recorded i mean commercially more than more than most um yeah. and so, and so i think that you have a an unusually large amount of objective information uh, uh coming at you when mm -hmm. when you're hearing yourself and so uh, uh surely that that helps with uh, but I mean, you know after recording is too late so so you have to deal, <laughs> deal with the problem before yeah. and that's interesting though because you know you're saying like we have to check it was great this noise that's coming out the box and we have to think about it like you know sometimes you i find myself telling students you need to mute that resonance because you can't have that there and then sometimes after a lesson i'm like i wish i'd been more explicit about why i wish they weren't just kind of believing me for telling them those notes can't bleed into each other and you know you like you said it c to g or like c minor to g major or something like that it's going to sound terrible if we've got yeah. these notes ringing on but and I don't mean that people don't have good ears, but sometimes when you're younger and you're starting out, you don't necessarily know why, and it it can feel great to let everything ring on. Do you know what I mean? Like you know, yeah. we're attracted yeah. to bass and we're attracted to resonance and sound, and it's um, it was just so nice to hear you just say, "Well, you need to check the sound that comes out the box." Yes, but you I know? mean, you, you, we we got pianists doing the same. So some pianists yeah. just. They they press the the, the gas pedal uh, and, and 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 play and it, it, it's you get a lot of sound of course and you can hide a lot of things yeah. in yeah. in this noise. and I yeah. well there, there there are some things that I think we need to check also I mean the intonation uh, that uh, that it's not just always where is the camera here it's it's not you cannot be sure that that. It's in tune if you have tuned the guitar and the, you, that you press. I, I think we we also have to listen and and correct with our fingers to yeah. to, 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 to make it in tune. I mean, it's it's, yeah. it's it's quite normal for a violinist. It's it's normal, but uh, yeah. it should be for a guitarist also. Mm, agreed. Absolutely. Agreed. We have a, a quite different questions just come in. Yeah. Um, oh. Yeah, and it's um, it's it's interesting because a lot of it, there's, it's not the only person that's asked a question about this album uh, across the universe. And um, there's a couple of other people who have asked it, but I've I've used David's question because it sort of summed everything up. But I know for people watching, other people have mentioned this on YouTube and things. Um, so um, David's written, can go and say something about his recording of Across the Universe on his album, um, here, there, and everywhere. I find it to be a piece that I listen to after I've experienced a loss, as it seems to have such a wonderful range of emotion. Mm. Well, yeah, I mean, all these comments I I, I get uh, from from people makes me makes my heart so warm. I mean, it's it's isn't it incredible? I mean, what we are the job we have that we can hopefully give something. 
to to the, to other people, uh, and uh, we get uh, gratefulness back. Um, but but that piece, I I, I said I, I prepared my recordings a year, but the, that Beatles uh, CD was I mean it was maybe five years work that uh, b before I, I recorded it. It was wow. uh, it was so so much. But uh, I grew up with the Beatles and. Uh, I was uh, nine years old when they released Help, and oh, wow. it, it hit me like thunder, you know, like <laughs> lightning. Uh, and uh, I, since since then, I, I I was I fell in love with, with their music, and I was fourteen when they stopped recording. So it, it was during these uh, really uh, very important years of of your life when. Uh, when we when we would get this music, me and my friends, we would listen to it, and we went to the record store to to buy the next Beatles uh, LP. And I think still I've heard more Beatles than than classical mu music uh, in my life. And uh, but well, yeah, the question across the universe, that arrangement or or shall I say version w was made by a friend of mine. Uh, his name is uh, Börje Sandqvist. He is an excellent guitarist and he makes uh, incredible arrangements. Mm. He's a, and he, he plays the 11 string guitar also and he, he's a fantastic piano player also. And, um, uh, and the, a colleague of mine at the school where I teach and uh, he wrote something that he spent maybe half a year doing this arrangement mm. and i think i spent uh, half a year trying to learn how to play it and uh, yeah yeah and, because it, it it's it's quite different and and you really use uh, um, all the strings or the whole instrument in in a very nice way and uh, yeah. i think uh, this piece i has affected uh, i got so many reactions from from different persons. Uh, my father, he loved this piece. He asked me very often to, to play it and uh, mm. he, he found it, it like uh, being like a meditation almost. And yeah. uh, it, I think it's more emotion than, than music in a way. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, well, it, it was a privilege to, to, to work with that piece and it's it's amazing to, to maybe end a concert uh, playing that piece because it, yeah. it, 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 the last notes, they just disappear out in the universe. And uh, yeah. it, it's philosophical that, the, I mean, the text, John Lennon's text is, is philosophical. Everything is so amazing with, with, with this music. Yeah, yeah. Thank do you, you so find, much. Do you find know. music that you have a personal connection to more difficult to interpret? on some level or another no i find it more easy <laughs> ah interesting yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I find it really difficult to, to to play a piece that i don't have uh, that i don't get get a personal relation to more more or less i mean it, uh, no I, I really want to feel this connection that uh, that i that i love or hate uh, or uh, get excited by or get sleepy by uh, by or, or whatever it is, but it has to touch something within me. Uh, if I, mm. I otherwise I, I, I don't have the patience to to learn it. I, I get fed up after I do the fingering and I, I I learn it usually quite quickly. But if if it doesn't touch my soul, I, I don't I stop playing it. Mm. Okay, that's interesting. And so what kind of factors, I mean, is that the primary factor for you in terms of what you would uh, play in a concert or record uh, is, yeah. is, is how it affects you emotionally? No, it's, it, I'm just thinking about how to earn a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, to that end, you have sold a lot of copies. Yeah. I mean, you know, let's, let's, no. let's not, I mean, you, uh, I mean, what has, what has affected you has certainly um, affected a whole bunch of other people, and no, so I, yeah. 
I'm, I'm, I'm not serious, of course. Of course, it's, of course. It's, we know, we know, don't worry. We know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> well, what would you do for money? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a, that's a good question. No, I, I mean, I was really lucky uh, with the uh, Deutsche Grammophon because I came in uh, at, at a, as a, a, in the right time, I think, and uh, I came with my 11 string guitar and uh, with a repertoire that was a little different and uh, we sold a lot of copies and uh, so, so basically I, I could record uh, whatever I liked. Wow. I really had to fight to, to make the, the first Beatles uh, CD. I re really, because they, they immediately said, no, that's not uh, what we do in Deutsche Grammophon. Interesting. And, and that was in, in uh, 90, I recorded in 90, it was released in 95, I think. Yeah. Uh, and uh, at that time, they didn't do these things. Now, now every record company do it all the time. But, mm. but that, that's another story. Uh, so um, I, I really had to, uh, and finally the, the, the boss of Deutsche Grammophon said to me in, in, in an international meeting with uh, people from all, all over the world, Deutsche Grammophon employees, uh, said to me, okay, uh, now I, I don't want to hear this anymore. Uh, you, you can do it on your own risk. <laughs> What were you risking? What what was the... Yeah, he didn't say. I, and oh. I, I didn't ask. <laughs> well, it worked out for you, and it yeah, worked out for the, Deutsche Grammophon. Yeah, yeah. But uh, then uh, we worked really hard, and they did a, a wonderful promotion for the for the CD, and it, we sold a lot of copies, and everyone was happy. Mm. And so they asked for a second bit of CD. Then. Yeah, exactly. Then they come back and want more. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, this... yeah. but, but I think it, it's it's quite normal. I mean, they, yeah. they, they yeah. were a really traditional gramophone company. And uh, yeah. here comes a young Swedish guy saying that he wants to record Beatles on, on yeah. a classical guitar. That's it, it. It couldn't get more stupid than that. Yeah. It's <laughs> taking new ground for them. But it's fascinating, though, because, you know, there are definitely pieces from our repertoire that are not as complex harmonically as many Beatles songs. Sure, you know, yeah. so when you think of like, you know, some of our, our 19th century repertoire, whether it be Carcassi, Carulli, Costa, Aguado, things like that, there are maybe four chords maximum sometimes, you know, even less in other ones. And then some of the sophistication, and you mentioned it in John Lennon's lyricism, but also in Paul McCartney, George Harrison's ideas about harmony were really beautiful. So it, when I hit here, you playing the Beatles, and I, I, I don't, personally, I don't see it as like, it's a completely different universe. And, you know, Deutsche Grammophon are stepping way outside their comfort zone. I know they are as a big record label at that period in time. But like you say, the fact they came back and asked for the second album, they knew that this works. And it's not that dissimilar. You know, in some ways. Mm. Yeah, and I, I, I think uh, also w what I do when I, I make the, my my Beatles arrangement is that uh, I kind of uh, play my memories of the of the music. Yeah. I don't I don't check uh -huh. with with their recording yeah. or I, do they change the chord here or there? Yeah, get there and everywhere. Or, I mean, and and so. And I think that that's that's really important. If we yeah. have, if we are doing a thing like this, that we have to do it uh, in a very personal way, and uh, it has to be in in a, in a deep, uh, uh, honest way. Yeah. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Well, this would be a great time to hear you playing a little bit of the Beatles, um, and I've got a little clip um, lined up of you playing um, Eleanor Rigby, which is such a great tune. Um, and and it just it, you just make it groove. It just grooves along fantastically. Everyone's going to hear it in just a second. But after we hear this, it would be great to hear you talking about where you're recording this, where you actually recorded this particular performance of Ellen Rigby, and what you're doing now with reaching out to a new audience online using YouTube and your channel, which is incredible, and also these these beautiful locations that you have where you're recording now. One of which is that red sofa um, behind you tonight in the shop. But let's have a little listen to. Eleanor Rigby.
that that's a good that's a good piece isn't it <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a great piece oh it's, it's a good arrangement a, yeah from from the the lp revolver yeah yeah i i i, I was so lucky to to become a, a personal friend of uh, sir george martin who was the beatles producer uh, and uh, so i met him many times so i i asked him why was it called revolver the yeah. the, the lp and he he said, uh, "Yeah, why not?" <laughs> but but I, I thought, "No, please, <laughs> George, why was it come?" Yeah, and he had, he he thought it was had to be, be with the revolver to to come back, spend the Spanish. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. That it, it it was not a, a revolver like a gun to shoot someone, but it was to come back uh, to something instead. I'm not sure if it, if it were if it, yeah that's that's what it's to yeah. revolt yeah yeah okay oh that's I never knew that that's fascinating. No. Also, yeah. I, I didn't. So um, yeah. So and, what, uh, where, where are you making these recordings now, Goran? This is a the, 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 these uh, you, you know you're doing all these beetle arrangements that you have. Yeah. And there was yesterday which we played on a on a previous um, episode and. I, I saw Penny Lane, I think, when I was looking to see what we could what we could listen to tonight. But so, you know, what what's what's um what's provoked you to start recording these things and sharing them all with us? It's we're so lucky. So we just want to know what I, what's going well, well, thank on. You. Thank you. Well, it's it's one of these things that I really had to do. I, I mean I have been playing Beatles songs on my guitar since I was ten years old. I mean more more or less. And I will continue as long as I live. To I, I, I mean, every month I, I I do one of or two new arrangement of Beatles songs. So it it goes on all the time. I mean, it it doesn't it doesn't have to do if I'm if I'm going to record or not. It's just something I need to do for for myself. Yeah. And uh, and um, well, I mean, Eleanor Rigby is is amazing. I mean, uh, Sir George Martin. He did a beautiful string arrangements for, yeah. for for. So it's just Paul McCartney and eight strings uh, in, in the in the original. That's that's it. So the challenge is okay. How do you on one guitar play Paul McCartney and these uh, eight? Uh, probably it's probably a double quartet. Uh, but anyway, you have like five parts uh, yeah. on a guitar. So I try to. Whenever there is a free spot, uh, I put a finger there and, and, and hit another <laughs> string. <laughs> so it's 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 like a, it's it's a little bit like a jigsaw puzzle. You yeah. know, is there a free spot? Okay, I can put another note here, and uh, mm. it's it, it, it's actually quite easy to play. It's not it's not difficult at all, but uh, it takes some time. But that there is no part where we, which is e exceptionally tricky, uh, and uh, yeah. and uh, well, the re I record we 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 me and my wife we have a, a barn actually. <laughs> yeah, I wonder. <laughs> because, <laughs> because my my wife is a painter, a professional painter, so she needs a lot of space, and um, so we bought uh, twenty five years ago uh, an old barn which which looked terrible. There was like trees inside, and uh, they just <laughs> <laughs> there were no cows anymore. But uh, yeah, it, it was dirty, and so. On. But then we restored it, and uh, we have a beautiful place mm. there with a very nice atmosphere, and it's completely quiet, which is uh, quite rare these days. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, yeah, mm. which makes it really. Uh, Wonderful to play. That the acoustic is fantastic there, also. Yeah. Well, you can hear it. You can hear it. Sounds fantastic. So, for everybody watching, Goran has an incredible YouTube channel. Just all you need to do is search, obviously, um, for the maestro's name, and his channel will appear if you're on YouTube, and you can subscribe to it. And you're up. I mean, I think you uploaded a video yesterday. I remember seeing because I subscribe and it pinged up, and I thought, oh, you yeah. always a day ago or something. Yeah, it was uh, uh, Troy Marai by Schumann. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which so you was, really yeah, it, uh, it was so hard because I, I, I made that arrangement for, for a Japan tour uh, more than 20 years ago and I haven't played it since then. 
and mm. I've really forgot because you, you know most guitar and lute pieces there you have the bass and then you have three notes at the top quite close together yeah but when you play piano music it's normally not like that the the the, the notes are spread all over so yeah. so and to find these uh, with the right hand to find all these notes uh, it was quite tri I, so i was just lucky to it was not a question of three takes. This was take eight or something. <laughs> that suddenly, when, when I almost gave up, I, I got a good take. Because I, I, I don't have a computer, so I cannot edit my videos. And uh, So it's, it's one take, all, all of it. Yeah, that's so beautiful. It, you yeah, can so some, sometimes the, I can make a good, good, good take, and the cat comes in and, and makes a lot of noise in the last <laughs> chord, things like yeah. that. Yeah, so let's make another one. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, we've got a question which we kind of have answered, and I wondered. Um, I'm just going to put it on the screen so people can read it, and Alexi can know that we're not ignoring you, Alexi. But um, Alexi, I think you need to listen to the beginning of the chat today. You maybe missed the first five or ten minutes or so, um, and it because we talked about it, Goran's early recordings being made with the actual cutting of real tape and how he approached um, that that process. And it's nice just to hear you say that at this point um, in your career, you're actually still doing these one take, these one take performances um, and then sharing with us with them on on YouTube. It's it's incredible. And it, it goes back to that thing that I think we were both, both, both of our, us Matthews here, were saying about that's what hits you, that flow, that musical flow in that direction all the way through. And when we hear you talk about what matters to you as a musician, that connection and that creativity and the, the, the thing that's beyond the notes, that is what comes across. And it's probably part and parcel of all of this, of this way of approaching music. Um, it's beautiful. Thank you so much for having, that your channel is a source of inspiration to me all the time. Same. Well, thank, thanks a lot. Um, uh, I'm happy to hear. It's, um, it was a, a project I did. Uh, I started in in the during the the pandemic, of course, and uh, because suddenly nothing happened, and uh, the golf course was closed for winter. And <laughs> I thought, what what shall I do? So I, I thought, okay, I I tried to record the six sarabans from from the six cello suites by Bach, and then then it just continued and uh, it it went well and. and uh, now it keeps me going. I, yeah. I, still, I still play a lot of concerts. Uh, yeah. I had to make a break with with the channel uh, last autumn because I, I was out playing concerts uh, all the time. But uh, yeah. but now it's a little bit more. Uh, I'm home a little bit more, so I I'm try to plan it a little bit better. Yeah. Well, we had you in Glasgow. Remember, just before the pandemic. Yeah. You came, you came to Glasgow to the Royal Conservatoire and spent a lot of time with the students, which they all just loved, and then obviously played a wonderful, a wonderful concert for us. So, I mean, it's great to hear the the strength and the energy of your music making all the way through your career. It's just, it's just so, so wonderful. There's a, a gentleman just logged in to say that um, he has to re-record the last notes of the pieces that he works on because he lives beside a fire station. So it's the sirens <laughs> of the fire trucks leaving. And I empathize with that living in a city uh, we uh -huh. don't quite have your Swedish countryside and the silence that it gives us. Yeah, um, in fact, we we had to make a decision uh, about that. We were going to record some Bach in in, uh, oh, in the yeah. studio there, but but uh, we ended up having to uh, uh, not do it because of construction that was right outside the yeah. uh, the door. So, and as as lovely as the construction guys were, they weren't really that interested. They didn't they didn't really rate Bach quite as highly as I think. The, the, us three do tonight you know i think they were like that's all very well and good but i've got to dig this hole so bach can wait yeah. you know so oh, yeah. Yeah. Quite, quite rude if you ask me but, but the, 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 yeah that was a question about uh, editing uh, when we record and I, I i think a little bit of uh, i mean if you do when you make a movie like uh, like uh, two hours long you you don't make that in uh, in one take sure yeah but, it, I think if we make a CD in one hour, we don't. We shouldn't even try to to make it in one take because we would probably get much too careful. And I think uh, the advantage yes. of being able to to make uh, to 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 edit afterwards is that we can uh, take risks that we maybe would do 
can do it would do in a concert. I mean, no one expects you to play perfectly, technically perfect in a concert, and mm -hmm. uh, but we expect it to be more or less uh, clean in in a recording. Yeah. yeah. So I I, th I think it's wonderful that we have the opportunity of uh, editing. Yeah. It is, yeah. It's just me being so stupid. So I I, I don't I, I prefer to go to the golf course instead of learning me how learning how how to to edit on a computer i think it sounds well i mean you don't really make any mistakes go on so i, I, don't oh, I do oh, you to... haven't heard i can show you <laughs> <laughs> afterwards okay. well, it's about time to listen to a little bit more of your music and um you can tell us a little bit about where this concert was and okay. I have a funny uh, relationship with this one recording because I used to work with a recording engineer and he used to say, when we, whenever we did live recordings and, and it was like after the live recording, thinking about if there was applause in the hall. And if you did a, if you did, you did a concert and there was maybe like just, you know, 150 people there or something, the applause can sound very good at one point, but then it can sound a little bit like someone's played a pretty bad shot in snooker. And it's like snooker applause where there's like just a, a few smatterings of applause. And I remember this engineer used to say to me, you need you need social levels of applause. That's what you need. Before you do a live album, you have to make sure there's a social level of applause. So wait till you hear the amount of applause and the size of this hall. I don't know if I'd have been able to. And then you go out and you start playing like incredibly difficult music and it's perfect. I mean, listen to this. Well, I, I think I played a, I, I think I played a wrong note just after where you stopped. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't think so. I really did. Really well, again, when, again, we're we're at a we're at a composer that's very important to you, uh, which is uh, yeah. uh, Silvius Leopold Weiss. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I would love to play I, to play the baroque lute because uh, mo most of his music is so connected to that instrument and to the D minor tuning. So yeah, it, it, really, there, there are not that many pieces, uh, I think, that, that works on, on the guitar. But, uh, but well, that, that's my opinion. But uh, so I, 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 mm -hmm. I listen to Nigel North playing Weiss, and, uh, yeah. and then I'm in heaven. He's, Nigel is my number one uh, source of inspiration, all kinds of musicians. I can say. Wow. I think he's such an amazing uh, musician and uh, person also. Yeah. Yeah. So Agreed. please uh, go and listen to, to his. Uh, he, yeah. he has made now four albums with the uh, Vice music and uh, it, it's just incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. That's a great recommendation. I mean, I've, I've, I've heard Nigel, I think, one time only in concert and uh, I, I really kind of left just a little bit stunned yeah. music just and and it sat with me for days mm -hmm. after and you know and i can even just remember that feeling now of just like oh my gosh it's it's so deep the way he plays yeah. um i mean he, he really treats uh music like a language yeah maybe it goes back to the to that he has played so much chamber music and he has played so much with singers 
So, I mean, uh, he's, I mean, we have to, at least that, that's what I, what I think and what I try to learn my students that uh, if music is a language, we, we should also accept that there are uh, long notes and there are short notes. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> like when like when we speak. Yeah, uh, the, yeah. Um, and the, silence. Yes, it's quite quite yeah. natural. But sometimes we there is a tendency that we try to play super legato, uh, campanella or, or whatever, and make each note sound just the same all the time. But that's that's not the way a normal person. I say a normal person <laughs> would talk. Mm -hmm. I mean, because we yeah. would fall asleep uh, after one minute listening to, to that person, or, or just leave. I mean, so so, and uh, I mean that that's incredible with uh, musicians like Nigel. That if we listen to how he's phrasing uh, when, when he's playing, how he's stopping and really using uh, music as a language, that that's great it's art it's fantastic well that actually i mean it, it, chamber music also figures very heavily into your output uh as well uh, and particularly with a uh, bowed string instruments uh mm -hmm. is 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 there something about the violin and the cello against the texture of the guitar that is um i mean there must be because you've done so many uh really wonderful projects like with gil shaham and jian wang um uh, the, these are these are wonderful uh, uh, projects. So, what is it about the bowed string um, <laughs> that that compels you so much? Well, I have actually tried to 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 go to uh, as often uh, if I get the invitation to a music festival. Not, not, it, I mean, I love going to guitar festivals also, but it's so great to, to meet other musicians and. Uh, uh, but but in this case with the Gil Shaham and uh, and uh, Jiang Wang, uh, uh, we were uh, connected by Deutsche Grammophon. Ah, I see. Yes, oh, that, yeah. that's a big advantage uh, if you are in a company like that. That uh, uh, that mm. uh, yeah, you are in. You get introduced to to, to musicians, uh, and mm. uh, I also. Did a record with uh, Patrick Galois, uh, mm -hmm. the flute player. Oh yeah, it, wow. Yeah, it was the same, same, same thing there. So, so, but I mean, to play with with a mu musician like Gil Shaham, I mean, it's incredible. I mean, well, I never practiced that much uh, like uh, when before our recording and when we went on tour, so, and, and so because his standard is so incredible and. Uh, is such a fine musician, so, so incredible. Yeah, and I really try. I mean, try to live up to to the standards. I mean, what he's doing on the violin, I have to do on the guitar also. Yeah. And again, yeah. it's not it's not only long notes; it's even some short notes and and, yeah. and uh, even some phrasing. It's <laughs> shocking, yeah. but, but uh, I mean these things that, that we really have to uh, treat the guitar as, as an instrument and make music, not, not just play the guitar. Mm. I have a little clip of you both playing together. And it's when I was li looking for clips, obviously you have this Paganini for two recording that you made. Um, yep. That was the first recording you made, right? With, yes. with, yeah, with, yeah. With, yep. And then there was a Schubert recording after that, I think. Right. Yeah. Yes. And I, um, I remember getting the, the the Paganini for two when I was working with a violinist, and uh, and he was a huge Gil Shaham uh, fan. And uh, the clip I'm going to show is not the pyrotechnics that Gil Shaham does through the whole recording. I mean, just virtuosic playing. It's actually you getting to play all the notes, and he is accompanying you actually, really. So it's completely switching it the way around. But I think you hear how. I, and maybe maybe after we hear the clip, you could you could speak to this, Goran. Like he seems to understand the guitar actually quite well, and I think it's evident in this clip we're about to hear now. Okay.
Wow. I mean, there, there, there's very, it's not every violinist who can do this. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's, uh, it's amazing. And uh, it's so beautiful. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it was so easy to, to understand uh, immediately what, what he was going to do the next, next second. And, yeah. Uh, I, I think we we connected really well because we we just met like uh, a month or two months before the recording. We met like one hour in a hotel room and just played through some things, and then we met for the recording. And we so we played through the piece, and then we recorded, and then we played through the next piece and recorded it. And because it was like having a conversation with with mm -hmm. an old friend or with a twin or i don't i cannot describe yeah. but uh, but it, it uh, that makes life um, so easy to to yeah. make music with, with such a person i i feel that that's quite rare um yeah in it and it really does feel like a conversation that yeah. uh, that 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 record that's um amazing uh that you just essentially we're listening to your first or your initial conversations um on that on that record remarkable well yeah it, it it's very much like a live recording actually because mm. i think it, we basically used take one on on each note on, on each piece because he never played I, I still i haven't pl heard him play a wrong note no ever incredible and, uh, and uh, so, so, so I, that that makes it easier, <laughs> actually. <laughs> because... Once he played at the proms in London at the Albert Hall, you know, fairly early on, I think, in his career. And I remember watching it as a, a young student, and like at the end of the performance, he was pouring with sweat, yeah. and he sweated through like you know his shirt and his jacket and everything. And it's just the commitment was incredible, and it was one of those things where like. As a young student, you're sort of thinking, you're only thinking about the music so much. And then someone tells you, you've got to wear some smart shoes and maybe some concert dress trousers and, and put a shirt on and actually think about how it might look. And I remember always thinking, well, I just saw Gil Shaham look like he was just about to die on stage. He was given yeah. everything he had. And I yeah. just thought, where are the priorities? Like, you know, you, it, it, playing like that, that person would be just the goal every time you're just so committed but then hearing him just knowing when to stay out of the way and knowing how to actually support your line playing that solo melody line there is just so unusual and it just it's just the be it's beautiful chamber music just gorgeous yeah yeah well yeah he's, he's great he's amazing <laughs> really it is it's, it's fantastic but i mean yeah. it, again it's uh i mean it's uh um it's a question of music as a language. I think mm -hmm. for, for me that solves uh, all, nearly all, all, all the questions, answer all the questions about how to phrase and uh, how to approach music. I mean, hmm. how would we tell a story to, to get, if, if you have a small child, how would you tell a story to, to get this child interested and to catch the attention? I mean, it's, it's the same when, when we play a piece. Uh, we shouldn't uh, tell all the secrets in the beginning. We, we have to uh, invite the listener. Uh, um, we have to, yeah, I mean, all these things to talk the language in a good way, like an actor. I mean, it, it's this, I, for me, it's the same thing to, to watch an act, a good actor or to listen to a good musician because it's uh, the art of communication and, and it's the art of language and that that is what counts and that yeah. makes it so much more fun to make music i think yeah because it, it opens up for millions of solutions and uh, and uh, that that's what's so great about it <laughs> and there's oh, something here. amazing about those 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 solutions happening in real time yeah. uh, if we're listening to first takes or um, or, or just not. Again, we, we keep coming back to this, but but you know, it's not every single note is edited, uh, and so we are really, really listening uh, to a performance. Which um, I'm realizing, I'm realizing in real time, 
um, m might actually be uh, one of the secrets to the magic of your recordings, Goran, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. I'm reading this uh, about uh, uh, hmm. Michelle as busker for this little girl, lovely, and by that I mean both the playing and as the little girl in the clip. Yeah, that, that was a part of, of the promotion for, for uh, uh, my Beatles. I, see. I, think, I think it was, uh, 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 we did uh, in a corner of Trafalgar Square. <laughs> I was sitting with, with a hat in front of me and playing um, playback Michel and, and, and then the, uh, a girl w was giving me a coin and they, they made a, a movie of that. <laughs> it was kind Beautiful. of... Or strange. <laughs> but even that type of promotion then at that time is unusual for Deutsche Grammophon and it's more it's more like pop music. They're treating it a little bit more like they want to broaden the audience and get people in and it's really special. Well, Goran, you can see from just the warmth of all these comments that are appearing um, how much your music making, whether it be recordings or people that have seen you live or students that have, have studied with you. Um, how much of a difference it's made to people's lives and I know Matthew and I both just adore your playing and when you know you said I'll come on and have a chat with you we were just so so excited and and, and we really appreciate spending this time with you this evening it's been really special well thanks a lot and I I, I, I really loved uh, the visit uh, in Glasgow some years ago and, and to see your students and they all played so well, and it was such a friendly atmosphere, such an open atmosphere. So that, that it was really great. Well, that means a lot to and, them, I'm sure. And the, the beer after the concert was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it is. Um, maybe to finish off, um, it would be nice just to finish off with a little bit more music. Um, and I'd found that. Um, oh, look, listen, people are are they're just. I have to put their comments on the screen because they're so. Lovely. There's, there's Randall um, over in America. Thanks for the wonderful chat. And Anne, who is uh, in Belgium. Um, I think you know you know yeah. Anne. Matthew, and and Goran, you've yeah, probably met Anne at guitar festivals in Germany and things. She's always at, at great festivals and stuff. So lots of people are tuning in tonight. And oh, that's great. Fantastic. Enjoying the chat. But I found this soar, this soar fantasy. Opus 30. I found a recording of you playing that, and when I said I was going to share it with uh, with with people this evening, you were you were really delighted. Yes, it's it's <laughs> it's one of the few things. Uh, no, not the few things, but the, but it's it was a live performance where where I was lucky to forget about myself and just uh, go mm. for it. And uh, so so I, I I I enjoyed this this recording. I think it's fun. It's from. Uh, Tokyo, uh, and it was uh, at my second Japan tour, 1985. Uh, also near the zoo in this Tokyo Bunka Kaikan Hall. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Well, here we go. We'll have a listen to this, and then we will say our goodbyes after.
Well, Goran, thank you so much uh, for being a part of this conversation. It's a true honor uh, for for Matthew and me to uh, to be able to uh, just discuss your career and your artistic process. It's 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 been a true delight. Well, thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. It's, it's been wonderful to 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 take part in in this conversation. Thanks to everybody for joining us. Um, and uh, our next show is going to be uh, March 19th. Um, we're excited about it. It's, we're, we're calling it um, Recording the Guitar, How the Pros Do It. We've got Nico Hauman coming in from uh, Open Strings Berlin. We have Drew Henderson, Matthew Anderson uh, uh, joining us. So please uh, tune in there. We'll have more details coming soon. Um, and uh, thanks to everybody for listening.